Good. So today uh, we start this first lecture today uh, covering the topic of object tracking. Um, you should have had already some lectures on that. So, and you have the project, so you are super familiar with this problem. And maybe you are not that familiar with how this problem has been addressed with deep learning techniques. That would be the, the goal of today's lecture, like seeing what people have been doing with neural networks and the problem of object tracking. Okay. So first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Andreu Girba, who has helped me in preparing the slides. He's an engineer at MediaPro, and they are dealing with this type of problems. So first, the motivation. Um, it should be quite clear to you, or at least with the description of the, of the problem we are trying to, to solve. So uh, in many works, like most of the works that I will cover, but not all of them, uh, they formulate the problem of tracking as a, by detection. So in many works, what they do is they, they detect many objects in each frame and then the main challenge is to to link the detections across frames and by doing that then uh, what you end up building are tracklets so which is like the trajectory of an object across frames yeah and you should be familiar with that I assume that Jen um, there are some data sets and benchmarks that that become more popular uh, especially in the deep learning area um, First, I'd like to highlight that um, this is a, a topic of high interest. So there are, there are so many interests, both from, let's say, scientific academia or science, let's say. And that's, that's shown because, uh, as you see in the next CPR conference, which is like the main conference for computer vision, there are uh, three challenges that deal with object tracking in different flavors. Okay, So there's this. Uh, MOT challenge that it kind of uh, it has kind of a longish tradition. Uh, there was uh, earlier there was a, another challenge called VOT and then um, video object tracking and now the MOT is like the multiple multiple object tracking so it's a bit more complicated. And actually one of the organizers like Claudia Leal he's a graduate from UPC and he's really pushing She's really pushing really hard on, on this challenge and this data set. And they are, if you look at the, on their website, they, they, it's, a, it's a very rich in terms of metrics and analysis of the different techniques that are developed there. And so this year, there's a challenge there. And as you, all of you have a tracking algorithm, you can always try to solve the challenge yourself with the, your models. Then there's this other challenge, the AI City Challenge 2019. You should be familiar already with it because that's the, the one you are looking at for your project, and in this case, so there are also multiple objects, and but in this case, there are like multiple cameras as well, and it's mainly thought about vehicles, or the idea, the main motivation is tracking vehicles, and to identify vehicles across cameras in junction. And there's, there's another workshop on challenge and target re-identification, a multi-target, multi-camera tracking, which is a little bit of everything, and I must say that I'm not that familiar with, with this workshop, but if you want to take a look, maybe you can tr try to solve it. Uh, regarding MOT, that's the one that, I, as I said, like that maybe has a, a longer tradition. That's the amount, more or less, of, of data that, that you see there, which is not huge, but that's enough for evaluating. And then there are like some other, maybe a bit large-ish data sets, which kind of combine uh, not only like the tracking, so uh, normally in, the, in just tracking database, you, you, you really suppose just to give, to give given an object to track, to track it, but there's an, another like a little bit more complicated task, which is okay, you have nothing, so go find the object and now track it, okay? Then it's the problem of detecting and tracking. And that was actually one of the tracks of ImageNet before it disappeared, and probably the less famous one, which was uh, ImageNet Bit. The idea in which you, you were really supposed to find uh, objects and detect them and track them across video frames. In terms of large uh, data sets, if you are going to tackle this problem, you probably want to look at this data set as well, the YouTube bounding boxes, which is quite large, much larger than, than the rest, and it was designed to have in mind to be able to really train your networks because you know that if you train them from scratch, you um, and you in a supervised way, you will need like a large amount of annotations. That that's the data set that provides that. 
OK, so let's start with some solutions that have been explored on the, to solve this task. So I really had a hard time <laughs> building this outline. And, and probably you'll notice that there are some concepts that they are across different words. So I will explain the concept, refer to some words, but there are words that combine one of one or more multiple of the concepts that I, that I, that I suggest. So the first one that, that is a bit oldish, it's uh, trying to track objects from uh, a neural network that it's trained for classification. Okay, um, before I go forward, like, do you have like an idea? Like, so if you have a neural network that you have trained to classify images, like ImageNet, and you say, yeah, okay, so that's what you have. Go and track objects now with that. Do you have any idea of where where to start? Um, you can provide me the answer based on whatever assumption you want. So what's easier for you? The kind of answer I'm, I, I expect, it doesn't really matter <laughs> if there are, there's one or five or... Yeah, well, if you know there's like a, an object, you yes? can check if it's close to a previous section of the object. So okay. <coughs> I get it. So, uh, okay, then, but check if it's close. How, how do you check if it's close? Um, yeah, but, but the neural network, it, it, so you fit an image? And it tells you, yes, there's a car. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all you have. That's classification. That's that's what. So that was my Try point. A window, for example. Okay. So, so you maybe you, you could like zoom into I different areas of the input image, and 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 for each location, you you look at the confidence, the detection score for car, let's say, and in the end, that would be some kind of heat map. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure. How, how, did you have any lecture on interpretability of neural networks? Yes, yes, some people do, some others don't. That's a bit tricky. Okay, so, so have you ever seen something like this? This figure? Who has seen figures like this? Who could tell me, like, what are you, look, what are you looking at? Nobody, I assume, then? Okay, then I, can, I would brief, yes? Okay. Can you develop a bit more or? Uh, Not this year. Okay. But you, you, so okay, from people from this year, uh, did you have any talk by Adriano on visualization? Which I don't think, because you had reinforcement learning and mm, what else did you have with Adriana Romero? And five people? The two days? Okay, so you didn't have this lecture. Okay, good, so don't worry. So I can explain it more or less. Um, um, so, so his point was really good, like this, okay, if I have no idea, so I want to detect, I want to localize my car in the image, and what, what he suggested, it's one of the first things that people kind of tried. Actually, instead of doing zooms there, what they did is they, they made occlusions over the image, and they look if the score for detection, it, it decreased, okay? So because if you occlude the area of the image where, the, let's say, the car was, then the detection score would, would, would fall, okay? Which is not this. <laughs> then there's other works. Uh, so this work, um, basically what it shows is that if you train a neural network for image classification, that's the important thing. So it means like you have a huge amount of image and you have like labels for the whole image. That, and then you look at the activations of specific convolutional filters you can see that some of these convolutional filters, they seem to be specialized in specific, uh, a class of objects, okay? And, and, and to, to look at this, I mean, you really, I mean, to, the, to, the, to, to know which of these filters is specialized, let's say, in food, okay? The only way to do it is to have another data set which is labeled uh, with, uh, no, sorry, you need to, to fit a uh, foot across the, the network and look at which neurons trigger very high for these images, but not that high for other classes, okay? And that's the way you can kind of identify which are the filters, convolutional filters that 
are kind of specialized for this class. And then if you do that, as you know that convolutional filters, they, they scan over the image, right? So what they do is they, so you have a convolutional filter which is much smaller than the image and you, you swipe it over the image and at each position you have an activation value which goes into the, ne to the next layer, yeah? Then if you identify these filters and then you look at the activations of these filters for one image that you know that contains food, at, at some locations the activation will be higher and some locations this activation will be lower. And that's another way to roughly localize in the image, detect in the image, the objects, yeah? Even if, if you, but notice that you don't train with any bounding box here. So you have a rough localization, okay? This, it's not perfect, but it tells you more or less here, screen, okay? So more or less the screen is around here. It's not a perfect localization, but you don't need bounding boxes to obtain this rough localization, okay? More or less. So this, this work uh, was developed uh, in 2015, and then based on this idea, like some, so some other work authors, they, uh, they thought, okay, so if I know that some of the convolutional filters, they are good at detecting some objects, can I use this to track, track objects in video? Yeah, and they did something similar, so they, they took um, a neural network that was trained on ImageNet, and they start looking at some different layers, okay? And they, and they realize that in this, I think that probably was a VGG network, so one of pre-trained networks, they realized that one of these layers was really good at uh, to detecting like, uh, let's say, um, objects, uh, like in general, but it was, and, and there was another one, so, so this one, this might be like detect faces, but um, it will detect like all the faces. And then they saw that there was another uh, layer, COM45, uh, 4.3, sorry, that it was better at discriminating between different objects. But they really like, it was very empirical, like, oh, yeah, we observed this, okay? And then they choose these two uh, layers, they look at the activations of these layers, and based on that, they built uh, a neural network, so yeah, BGG, that when you fit uh, your, your frames, um, you take the, the activations from, from COM53, that was the general one, that more or less it tells you like, yeah, there's the, like objects, so, so there are like two people, one or two, you have more or less activations around these semantic objects, and they look at this other layer, COM43, and that they saw that that was much better to, if you wanted to, to distinguish between different types of objects. Then during tracking, what they did is they, they let's say they fine tune this uh, this part, so there was some online learning, so that this this layer it was specialized in um, sorry this part of, of the network was specialized for tracking that specific object, and there was an, this other part of the network that came over here. Um, it was like more general, so in case there was a new object appearing, a new person appearing, that that part would would capture it. Okay, it's a little bit like handcrafted everything but it was one of the first efforts in trying to use these convolutional filters as trackers, okay? So I'm not saying this is the, a very nice and clean way to solve object tracking, I'm just saying that that was the first efforts in trying to use convolutional networks for tracking. Okay, a little bit more uh, tailored solutions. Um, they are uh, correlation filters. Have you, have, have you in any of the lectures uh, look at correlation filters for tracking at all? Probably not. Okay, good. So anyway, so there's a, there's a family of uh, tracking algorithms before deep learning that uh, basically what, what they expect is that you, are, you, you have a filter that you expect it will generate a high activation when, when a convolutional filter that uh, you will generate a high activation when uh, it, it processes the object that you want to track. Okay, and that's that's a family of, of, of techniques. Then, so that already existed, has been there for a long time. And then in this work, again from 2015, what uh, some people did is like, okay, let's take a neural network that's trained for image classification, a VGG, same thing. And they, they thought if the filters, they, they studied if the filters, the convolutional filters that are learned for image classification, if they would be useful for tracking objects, 
Yeah, using, using, you know, instead of, instead of you know, using the DCT or a wavelet transform or whatever, you, you take the convolution of filters that are, tra that are learned by a neural network. And they made this study about uh, filter from different layers, and they observed that, that the convolution of filters that, you l that are learned in the first layer, they are like the best ones for this task. And, and that, yeah, they were kind of useful for this task, more or less. Um, what, what did these filters, uh, what, do, what, what do they do? So the convolution of filters from the first layers, um, here what, what you see are the responses of uh, different convolutional filters. So you, if you have like this input image, each column are uh, the responses of different convolutional filters. You know that these filters, they are learned automatically. Nobody tells the filter if they should learn about color or textures or whatever. And what they observe is that uh, the f these filters, they, they, some of them were specialized in orientations or in color. So they were kind of, you can, th the, the responses, they resemble some of them, um, you know, like edge detectors, probably like this one, it resembles this one. Maybe this one, let me see, I didn't talk about that, but it should respond to, this one seems to respond quite a lot, a lot for this color or texture, not very sure. But that's what they can observe. So did, did, did so I mean, this, this class of like visualizing the filters in the first layer, did, did you see them ever in any module? No, okay. But so, okay. If you want to explore later, I'll, I'll add some reference if you want in the future, okay? If you want to check it out. But, but it is, if, if, if you look at the, what these commercial filters look like, you realize that, that yeah, they, 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 they are some kind of edge and color detectors. And then what they, what in this work they observe is that these filters, they can be useful for, as correlation filters for tracking. That's a story, okay? And they are still like um, filters train for another task, for a task of object classification. Uh, sorry, for image classification. Yeah? Then, if these people, they realize that the filters mm -hmm that are learned in a convolutional neural network for image classification, they could be useful for object tracking. What would be the, the next logic step in research in deep neural networks for this application in, in this line? What do you think is in the next slide? So it, it's, they are kind of, the questions are kind of easy, okay? So I'll try to reformulate to give some, give some hints to you. So these authors, um, they saw that if you take a neural network and you take look at the, the filters that are learned in the first layer, um, these filters, um, if you, we use them for some tracking technique called correlation filters that I know that you are not that familiar, but yeah, no. they are so filters that you scan through the image and they, and they work pretty well for as correlation filter for tracking, yeah? But these, fil these filters, they were used, they were trained for the task of image classification. They're, so they took like all the images from ImageNet with their image labels, and you train for, for that. You, you, I, I'm pretty sure you had a lecture on image classification with ImageNet, yeah? Then what would be like the next logic step to improve performance? So you, you, I mean, th these are, this is a network that it's trained for image classification. Do we want to solve image classification in this today? No. What are we interested in today? What's the lecture about today? Okay, that's, okay, yeah, well, thank you very much. I was going to leave the room. Yeah, so this is tracking. So what should we try to do if we want to improve performance? Sorry? Yeah, okay. okay, so you, you, you we need data, label data for tracking, and, and then we are going to train a new network to do what? To do tracking, yeah? 
OK? I, I know that you have no idea how to train that, but the concept is, it's, it's, that's a concept, OK? So whatever, however they do it, they, they do it, the concept is, so I have a network. I train it for one task. I, look, I take its components, and it, they work pretty well for my task, but, but that network was never trained to solve my tracking task, OK? So the next logic step is like, okay, so can, can, I, can I modify these filters, these parameters, so that they are better for the task that I want to solve? Yeah? Good, good question. So that's exactly what, sorry. Uh, so that's ex exactly what these people did in 2017. And they won the, the VOT challenge, which is one of these challenges of tracking, based on this idea, OK? So um, maybe the training is a bit more complicated to explain, but um, basically they, they managed to uh, train a correlation filter that, uh, let's say, that, that made that, that uh, help in tracking when, 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 when using the correlation filter paradigm for tracking, yeah. I don't want to get into details, but the idea is that it was trained for this task, okay? That's, that's all. And for now, that, that's it, okay? Um, so here you, you see like uh, some responses of these filters uh, from different layers. Um, so, so if you have never seen that, that's a bit complicated to understand, but okay. Just imagine that you have like uh, frame T and you want and you have frame T plus tau, so in the future, and you want to uh, find this object, okay, this plane in this, in this future frame. Yeah, that's, that's the goal that you want to do. And the way how, how they, they did it is they, so they train in a network, such as when you, uh, when you um, fit the, the, obje the object to track into the, into the network, it's going to have the highest activation um, in the area in which the, the object appears in the next frame. That would be the idea. So what you see over here are the correlations of the, between the features at COM3, COM4, and COM5 for these two frames separately. And basically, uh, by looking at the correlations, you can localize. So when you see, not, not at the pixel, you're not doing correlation RGB against RGB, but you're doing correlation uh, between COM3 field, COM3, sorry, COM3 uh, activations, COM4 activations, or COM5 activations, and, and you find the highest responses where, where these features, they, they match the most. And that helps you into, into detecting the object in the, next, in the feature frame. So this scheme, um, so anyway, they basically, they, in, this, in, the, in this other work, so now I change work, but this one it was the basic one with correlation filter, the classic tracking. And then in this other work, they both solve the, the tracking and the detection. So remember at the beginning that I showed you like, in some works, you are giving the bounding box you need to track it. In other works, you need to detect the object and track it. So in this other work, in this second work that I'm showing, so th they are similar, but so this one and this one are different, right? So in, in this second one, they were solving both the detection and the tracking. And they, they managed that by combining the correlation filters that you have over here with, um, so do you, do you know what RPN stands for? No idea, okay, that's, I'll give you a tip. It's related to, yes, region proportional. So do you, do you know like in which class you've seen that? Detection, energy detection, yeah. So region proposal networks are uh, neo networks that give an image. What they do is they, they generate multiple, a huge amount of uh, bounding boxes that could be objects, okay? So more or less, and again, I'm not entering in the details, but that's, that's enough. So this architecture, it combines the correlation, so the correlation between the convolutional features with the object detected with a region proposal network. And uh, where have you seen this ROI pooling? Have you heard this word in the past? 
in with and if you have. So has anybody? So what does ROI mean? Okay, let's start here. Region of interest, great. And and this so this is a special type of layer that it became quite popular for for a specific network that it's very popular, which is and you have used it, many of you or all of you have used it in the project, yeah. RCNN? Yeah, uh, I think it was RCNN, I think so, yeah, right? So RCNN, faster RCNN, faster RCNN, they are using this type of pooling for object detection, okay? So the, the idea is that you, you have a, a fixed size uh, to the feature map over which you are going to classify <coughs> And in this case, uh, also the regression of the boxes. Okay, and then they, they, they kind of did like the, the ROI pooling. They introduced something called like ROI tracking, which is similar to ROI pooling, but across two, two different frames. Um, okay. So another uh, approach for exploiting uh, the capability of deep neural networks in tracking is um, using them to learn features that will somehow be used later to solve a tracking problem. And, there's, and here it's quite diverse, but because in the end, like neural networks, they, they always learn features. But um, till now, I, I tried to. And so the rest of, of, of techniques, they, they try, they are maybe they are more oriented to soft tracking, and the techniques that I mentioned now, they are more oriented like, okay, I learn a feature and, and later I do something else. Okay, and now I, I put the emphasis like learning the features. So actually like the super first uh, work that I found that uses deep learning for object tracking, uh, it does something which is basically, it does something else, but basically what it does is it, it learns features in learning with this uh, architecture, so the architecture you have your input data, let's say your um, your image. They did something here a bit weird. Oh, well, it's, well, it's not weird. They corrupt the image, and the corruption means like you add noise or you add some kind of uh, synthetically you add some variation that you expect that in in the in the real in when you run your system, you're going to have this kind of distortions, okay? Then you feed that into a neural network, so that would be like a hidden state. And okay, it's a HI, so uh, there's, I think it's in this, well, in this example, there's only one hidden layer, but there could be many more. And here at the output, what you want to reconstruct is what the clean signal, yeah? Then, so this structure, do you remember what's the name of this architecture? Autoencoder, it's written in the slides, okay, but we saw it the other day in, in class, yeah? In autoencoder, it's great because you can train NEAT without any annotation. You don't need anybody labeling anything, okay? And that's a way to learn features. Um, in this case, so this actually is called the denoising autoencoder, and it's an architecture that's well known, and by itself it's useful because if, if you learn a, a neural network that removes the noise, so here you, you, add, you add noise here, right? And here at the output you expect you don't want the noise. So that by itself it's, it's already useful, okay? The other day we were discussing about uh, why I think those can be useful and thing you told me about compression and so on. That's another classic application like for denoising if you have noise. But anyway, we, we're not that interested in denoising because what, what they did in, in this uh, kind of oldish work is they train a, a, an autoencoder and then they took the encoder of the autoencoder. So you see that, so here it was only one layer, but now like if, if we make a zoom, it, was actu it actually had like many layers, <coughs> okay? And all these layers, they, are, they belong to a, a multi-layer perceptron, so these dense layers. And then, so the encoder that was learned from the autoencoder, so this part, so they took this part, the encoder, so they, they, they discarded the, the decoder part. And uh, the encoder actually, 
it was so it was used to, to pretend uh, to pretend the these layers, and at the end it was it was trained as a binary classifier to solve uh, the tracking with a particle filter. And then the question is, have you had particle filtering in any other module? No, okay, so there's another super, yes? Some people have, okay, anyway. Sorry? In this model, okay. With Ramon? Okay, so some of you <laughs> saw it. Anyway, so, so there, it's a popular tracking algorithm that you might know or not, but the idea is that this popular algorithm, at some point, it, you, you have a particle and you want to decide if, if, this, if this particle is good to track or not, okay? And so in this work, they actually they train a neural network to make this decision if the particle should be tracked or not. And they could train it because it was first, so because all these layers, they were pre-trained with, with a autoencoder, with the encoder of the autoencoder. Yeah, that's from 2013, so that's kind of old, but um, then uh, just to make sure that you understand what I'm talking about, so um, do you know, so in, in this network, do you know what was the size of the of the images, of the input images? Or, or at least do you know how, how you could compute the size of the image with this information you have here? If I tell you they are square? Yeah, so that, so you have this 1024 and, and it's flat and it's a multi-layer perceptron, okay? So, okay, so actually it's 32 by 32. They actually took 80 million, so, so not, not bad, uh, tiny images. That's the first thing. And then um, if you had, now with all you know, after all this, because it's the last class, now you know a lot about deep learning and images and processing, if you had to adopt something similar, this autoencoding approach, would you, what, what would be the basic change you would, ch you would change from this architecture? You would say you wanted to extract some features to later fit into a, into a particle filter, whatever that is. What would be the, the basic change you're going to do? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, so, so as you have seen through all the models, like when you process images or video, like having the special neighborhood that's interesting to have. And probably in, in this world, 2013, they were not really that interested on, on vision. They were looking at something else. But they, they already mentioned in 2013 that they, it would be interesting to investigate uh, CNNs, okay? But 2013, it, it was not, there was, the computer vision boom was not, was just starting, so makes sense. Then we go from 2013 to 2018, so just the opposite. Um, so in this world, they, what I mean is that they, they learn features with a multilayer perceptron, which is probably quite a bad idea if you are dealing with images. The most natural idea would be using convolutional neural ne networks. There are many ways to uh, learn features. You can use uh, the triplet loss. Have you seen triplet loss somewhere? Yeah, so you, you, you have pairs of, of, let's say in this case, objects that, so boxes that <coughs> correspond to the same object and another box that doesn't correspond to that object and then you, you want to, to make the, the two matching objects close in the, in the space, but you want to push apart the negative sample. Yeah, that's triple loss and it has shown that it has quite nice properties. And they, so they, they train with uh, triple loss and they do like whatever other uh, tracking algorithm. They did this, this clustering. I'm not that interesting in that. I'm just, remember that here I'm just pointing out that you can use neural networks to train your features and then do something else, which is not neural networks. Then there's this other work uh, that, so if, notice that I, I, I took an example where you learn features with, with a multilayer perceptron, fully connected layer with a CNN, and now this last one, it's with an RNN. So here the idea is like um, to encode, so learn a representation of the object you want to track, but not just from one frame, but you want to somehow learn the temporal um, evolution 
of the in this case of the appearance of the object you want to track. Okay, so that would be like um, so you see you, you imagine you want to track this this uh, this person and you and you already have all these bounded boxes. Okay, you have already detected them or they are given to you somehow. And what you do is you f wait. I think there should be sorry. This should be before. So the idea is that you feed that into a convolutional neural network. The features that you extract from the last deep layer from convolutional neural network, you feed them to a recurrent neural network across time. And then at the end, you take the hidden state, the representation of the recurrent neural network at this time step. And that this, this feature, it hopefully, it represents the whole temporal evolution of your object. Yeah, and then you have you have a, a feature that will be useful for something else. But this feature, you are encoding the evolution, the, the sequence, temporal evolution of the of your object. That's the important thing. Yeah. So again, in this world, they do this with they do actually they do it with the bounding box, so with the appearance with the RGB images. They also okay, they also do it um, the same the same spirit. They also fit um, the motion vectors. Of the object, so in this case, they are trying to predict the the trajectory. So, let's see the the velocity that the object is taking within the image. So, if, if you have an image that if you have an object that it's let's say it's moving from left to right, if you only have one frame, you cannot encode that, right? You need you need to consider different frames so to somehow encode and tell and, and, and having a feature that your object is moving, is moving from left to right, and that's a I think quite, a, quite an elegant way to do it. Because you, you you let the recurrent neural network they use an LSTM in this case to to encode it. So in the end you you encode it. And uh, actually what in this work what they do is um, th this work it's it's uh, it's what it's trying to do. It's uh, given an, an object that I want to track and a candidate <coughs> detection in my next frame. So just imagine that first you so you, you have a a, next, a new frame that you want to process, you detect the objects, and you want to do this to compare if, if this, uh, so for each of the bonding boxes you have detected, if they are going to do a good matching with, with any of the objects you are tracking. Okay, so here, in this part, you are encoding uh, the whole trajectory of the object, and in this case, you are supposed to be comparing with one of the, with the, the, in this case, with the, with the speed that you would have, with the, with the, with the, sorry, with the motion we would have, if this detected object was following this this uh, trajectory, and they also do something else with, uh, so they, they they also encode the they call it the interaction, like how uh, the box that you want to characterize is located with respect to the other detected objects. In the end, so so they they compare this. And, and they fuse the appearance, the motion, and the interaction in a simulated score. And this simulated score is what it allows to match the targets that you are tracking with the detections that maybe you had with a bounding box. Yeah? So this is the classic approach. So it, th this part is not specific from this algorithm. This is what so many algorithms do. They, so you are tracking, in this case, n objects. You have, in this case, they also have n, so probably you should have like n, another number. So you have like whatever amount of detections, and you want to to do the matching. And with this, okay, they, they propose this network to compute this similarity score. But they, what's interesting from this network is the way how they encode the temporal evolution of the appearance, of the appearance, the motion, or the interaction. Okay, so let's go. Then, similarly to what I'm to, to the last one, actually, uh, there are these matching functions that I think that you have already seen, which is like, uh, so imagine that you have this problem that you, you are tracking, you have an object that you are tracking, and now you have like all these detections because you computed with, uh, with your object detector, and you want to find which, which is the, the one that matches. And one way to do it is like, uh, we learn, so we train, what's called a, ma a matching function, a function that given your, uh, the object you are tracking and one of the candidate targets, it will tell you if they match or not, yeah? Then I think that, because the other day you mentioned in class that you already know 
the basic architecture to solve this problem. Uh, can you, do you remember which one was it? So imagine that you have like what, the problem, right? So you have an object that you know that you are tracking in one frame, and you have like n candidate detected detected objects in the next frame. What would be like the most classic way to compare if, if, if two bounding boxes, they, they match or they don't match. There's an architecture that, yeah, well, yeah, same as networks is kind of the, um, okay, I think I already said that. So that would be like the, the one of the first works on, on doing tracking with uh, same as networks. So the idea is that you uh, fit uh, the, the two candidate objects and you want to know, you want the, the network to tell you yeah, if they match or they don't, right? They call it, it's called Siamese because like the two towers, like um, they are sharing the parameters. Yeah, so when, when you train, like whatever you update here, you also update it here. It's the same, the weights are the same ones. Of course, the, not the activations because you are feeding different uh, boxes or, or frames here. And normally like the, the novelty or the discussions are, okay, so you, you, you may have like a common uh, tower, so you have like whatever architecture that is, and then there are some um, works about what's the best loss to train this. Yeah, in this world they use something called the, con the con contrastive loss, margin contrastive love, loss, sorry. In this uh, other world, the semis is over here, so you are trying to to compare, so they, they would, here, here for example, they would like to know if these two uh, objects, they, they correspond to the, to the same one, so you could fit them into, you could stack, in this case they would stack it, it's not two towers, so in this case there are like two towers, <laughs> but you could also like just fit it, uh, con concatenate them and, and train a single tower, that's something you can, maybe, maybe we can discuss if it's, they call it Siamese junction. Um, but in the end, you are, you are going to train a network that will tell you if, if they match or they don't. In this work, apart from doing this match or not, which is in this tower, um, they also have like another contextual features that seems to, um, it's giving information about the, the relative position or conte context for each of the bounding boxes. Because otherwise you only, if you do the crops on the objects, you, 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 you miss uh, what's around. Okay, the almost final approach and we like like learning to track. Okay, so all these, everything I explained here, like they are just tricks to try to avoid <laughs> solving the tracking problem. Like, yeah, I do some trick, and in the end, I do the tracking, right? And then some people have tried. Yeah, can, can we really like train a neural network that does everything? So, what are the solutions there? So, I, I will say that actually, the there's probably some room for improvement still there, but I'll show you like some of the works. Um, in this case, it's a, a little bit weird problem, but they are doing tracking, but they are doing tracking with synthetic data, okay? And um, the idea here is that uh, you must imagine that you have, uh, say you have a robot, because I'm going to show you a video, it's a bit weird to, to, to understand, so you have a robot, okay? And the, so if you have a state like this one, so imagine you have a, there are like three objects, this object, if the robot is here, is going to occlude this other object, right? And here you have the speeds. So they were trying to, to explore if by uh, using a recurrent neural network, that recurrent neural network would be able to cope with the occlusions, you know, because this object, let's say, it, it starts here, and then at some point it crosses in this direction. So at some point this object is going to occlude this, this other one. So they were trying to explore if, if by using recurrent neural networks, so by using the memory that natural recurrent neural networks have, uh, the system would be able to, to track, to manage occlusions, right? And, but then they train that as, as this is a bit, it's quite tough to train neural networks and recurrent ones, they actually train with synthetic data. That's why you will see that the video is a bit weird, it's not people on the street, okay? Let's see, it gets a bit long. 
object. So that, that's the kind of uh, so that's the real object and that's many uh, moving the occlusions. That's what the Due to occlusions, the not all the objects are visible. Sees, okay? and, and directly they, produce positions that's, that's of what, all that's objects how they as train an output. It, so that's what the robot sees. The network consists of yes. these positions of the, all objects as an output. The, Network was predicted the network object. consists of three parts, the actual position encoder, of the detecting directly okay. visible objects in the so, network so in a simulated scenario. They kind of the network was able to learn to detect objects in a stream of data and track their positions mm -hmm. even in the case of full occlusion. This was achieved by adaptation from, of the hidden the layers. Then there was this other work which is like closer to what we would expect. And it's a nice effort, but uh, if you read it, you'll, you'll notice that, okay, that they have very interesting ideas, but they are not fully solving the problem of end-to-end -end tracking with a recurring neural network. Then final approach. These are called regression networks. Um, then the regression networks, it's, I think it's a very smart uh, approach. So, Imagine that you have uh, the previous frame, let's say, you the crop of the object that you want to track, okay? And then you're going to feed that into convolutional, convolutional layers. And you will train a network so that given this crop, okay? Uh, so let's say this, the, the coordinates of, of, of the crop on, on the, let's say, the previous frame, it will tell you uh, where to crop in this frame, okay? That's that's the, the interesting, that's the, the, the nice part. So you, you are, first of all, you are not feeding the whole frame into the commercial, ne commercial network, which makes things a bit easier. And, and the crop on, let's say, in the target frame, the frame where you want to track this object, the spatial location of the crop, it's defined by the, by the object you want, by the coordinates on the previous frame. Then you feed this crop, that's where you want of the you want to track. The crop, that's called, uh, let's say, the search region, you feed both of them the commercial layers, you have at the end some fully connected layers, and the output, it's the bounding box, so the coordinates of the bounding box, on uh, this frame, yeah? On, so on, on the, sorry, on this crop. And what is nice is that, um, so of course to train this, you, you need to have annotated data, you, you need, to, when you train, you need to have many bounding boxes to train all these parameters. But, uh, but I, I think that, it, that it's kind of, uh, let's say, that's, they call it regression network because in the end, somehow, what you're doing is, is, okay, so I want you to think it in another way. So if I know that in the previous frame, my object was here, so sorry, was here, that would be like over here, yeah? So if, if I, so this phase, if I, Located in this current frame will be more more or less over here, and that's that's what I where I fit into a network. Then you expect the network to, let's say, regress. You, you can think that maybe uh, you have a candidate detection here, okay? Which would be like imagine that the that the, that the object doesn't move, so you would have a a bounding box candidate one here, just repeating the location of the box. And now you ask the network to regress, it means to to adjust the neural network to whatever exactly the object is. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the key idea. Yeah, you, you expect the, the network to regress, so the, the box you are regressing in the end, it's, it, you can think that it's, it's the, they are the limits of this crop, okay? So you can think that, that there's a bounding box here and you want to adjust it, you ask, the net, you ask the network to adjust it. And that works pretty well, it can run pretty fast according to the authors. And um, this idea has, so still this, this, in this first work, uh, it was run, uh, let's say, by pairs of frames separately, like every pair of frame was processed separately. Then there was another improvement here that they do exactly the same thing, they do the crops. They do, um, on top of the, let's say, the, so you extract the convolutional features, and now over here, here, so, so this is a co the fully connected, and this one, so the last one that predicts the box coordinates, x, y, for the box coordinates, so this arrow over here, it means that it's a recurrent connection. So 
this last layer, it's not uh, fully connected. Let's say it's uh, an LSTM, so it, it, remember, it remembers uh, what was the bonding box in the previous frame. And of course, that, that regularizes all the predictions because it's, uh, if, if, you tr if you treat, so in this case, they treat each pair of frames separately. So you couldn't really have like large variations between the predicted bonding boxes. While in this other work, as you have this recurrent connection here that has some memory, it remembers the previous prediction, the previous bonding box, what it was like, and that helps a little bit in, in having more uh, coherent predictions. Yeah. Uh, well, they did something else. So do you know about skip connections? Probably from segmentation, maybe. Yeah, so they also did this to improve the quality. And I think that's the work. There are some examples over here, yeah. I think, wait, just hold on maybe. I think it's this next paper, this one. Let's hold on, yeah. Uh, and okay, it's fine. Yeah, so here you have some examples of how it works. Then, last, last work, but I think that's the most relevant for me, <laughs> so that's why I save it for last. It's, uh, what if we take, if we kind of combine some of the different things we've seen, what if we take um, this regression, the idea of, of regressing the bounding box that we already have, and we combine it with ob like what, like how we are dealing with object detection in sort of modern architectures. So first of all, um, I'm showing you here the, this architecture of faster CNN, which you, I hope you have seen. Yeah, because I asked you earlier. So uh, just very quickly, uh, that's a very popular uh, architecture for object detection. What you have is you have your image, you fit it into convolutional layers, and then you, ha you have like two branches, one branch, what it does, this RPN, it generates this uh, region proposal network. That's what I asked you. That's why I asked you earlier about it, okay? And so it generates a, a huge amount of proposals. And then these proposals, they are fed into uh, another layer. So the proposals combined with the convolutional features that were already extracted here, they are fed into another layer that are going to generate for each proposal uh, a classification, so a class, a label and uh, classification score, so kind of a confidence. Yeah, that's faster as CNN, explain in one minute. Then about faster as CNN, I want you to focus on this part, the region proposal network, that's why I insisted earlier. And if you remember, or if you don't, I'll show you now, what this uh, part is doing us is uh, for, it, there's a sliding window over the convolutional features that we extract over here and for each of these uh, locations, there are some locations there uh, on the convolutional layer, it's going, so this feature will be fed into a multi-layer perspectron that will uh, give you a score of objectness for, in this case, 2,000 uh, uh, boxes and the coordinates for these uh, anchor boxes. In, in total, okay? So the, the idea, and here that's the important thing, is that these coordinates, the coordinates of the bonding boxes, they, they don't, uh, I mean, it's not, so you have the sliding window, you, you place it over this uh, area, this location over the convolutional feature map, but then the bonding box doesn't, probably it will not exactly fit this, this, uh, this square region, but it will have like whatever shape. Okay, and in order to adjust, to regress, and that's the important thing, to regress, to adjust the, the, where exactly the, the dimensions and the locations of the bounding box would be of an object that could be, that will be extracted from the features observed over here, that's, you have this bounding box regression. And you can think that what we are doing in this direction is like, okay, I have here a more or less, more or less a rough estimation, an approximate estimation of of where an object is, and this branch is telling me is uh, generating many, so many proposals of bonding boxes that might be good to represent an object over here. They are regressing this input bonding box and actually generating many of them. Yeah. Then, 
if you follow this, how to do this, how to solve this for uh, object tracking. So what you could do, so that's a very recent work from last month. So it's um, given an object you have detected and you are trying to track. You just take the location of the bounding box. You place it exactly in the same, so in the next frame, in frame T, you take the coordinates of the bounding box in T minus one, and you feed that into the regression, into, into kind, of, kind of a bounding box regressor to this part of a faster CNN architecture. What this branch will, will do is modify, so adjust the bounding box so that it matches uh, the image in time step t because the, the image is being fit, the full image is being fed over here, right? So it, it's regressing the box of the previous, of the object in t minus one to the potential location of the object in, at t. Yeah, so it's, it's a way of updating the bounding box after each frame using the bounding box regressor um, from faster CNN. Okay, and I'm insisting a lot because I think that if that that's, would be great if you could do it next week for the project. Okay, that's why I'm insisting a lot <laughs> because it's kind of feasible to do. Yep. Faster as CNN. To find the bounding box and to classify them. So when you feed, feed it, from, it just makes it faster, no? So you're skipping the point. Oh, but, you, but, but when you feed it, you are already solving the tracking problem. You, yeah. want, you want to solve the tracking so problem, you, like? You give it the class. Yeah, but well, well, you're giving. So, hey, in, in frame T minus 1, I had this box. Yes. Where is it now? Where is it in T? So if, if the network, oh, yeah, it's there. You, you, I mean, the, the tracking problem, like, you don't, it's, no it's solved. There's, well, there's no tracking yeah. problem, if you want. But um, wh what you're saying, I think it's coming now, I oh. think. Because, um, yeah, that would be the basic idea. Then, things that happen in tracking, it's that sometimes objects disappear, right? So, what, how, how does it deal when the object disappears? So, what, what it does is, actually, as there's also a classification branch over here, oops, the classification branch, um, if it tells you, hey, there, that's, that's no object, okay, so I, I regress the bounding box, it's there, but, but that's not an object, then you, you just kill that track. Yeah, the classification branch of uh, faster CNN, it, there's a, an output tells you that's, like, the confidence is very low or whatever, and you can just kill the track. <coughs> then uh, maybe going to your question, like, there's also a detector, so that's actually also detecting, so you, you, you feed the, you feed the, full image and that's detecting all the objects, right? Then what you do is like, so you look at the detections that it generated here. There's a missing red line here. But I will return it later. Um, so you, wait, hold on, I think I can do it. Sorry. So um, the detected bounding box, you see if if they kind of, let's say, match with the ones that you have tracked, and if, if they are already tracked, that's fine. You, you just discard them. But if you have a, a, a new, det uh, an object detected like um, this one, so imagine you, you, feed, you feed this image to the faster CNN, it tells you that there's this object. And when you look at, uh, so you know, this object was not being tracked, okay? But it's detected. Then what you do is you create a new, a new track, new tracklet, and that's how you can manage like to to uh, the the appearance of new objects in the in the scene. Yeah. So that's a way, quite an easy-ish way for tracking, and of course I wouldn't insist so much if if the authors didn't show that it works pretty well, so it's obtaining set of the art in, for different metrics in, in kind of an easy setup. So actually, the, what I explained, they call it tractor. Then they do something else called uh, re-ID, which means like, what, what if, let's say, let's imagine that uh, this person uh, I don't know, enters into the room and then, sorry, into the shop and then it, 
uh, he gets out again later. So by doing this, we will we'll be lost because we are just dealing with pairs of frames, right? And there's some technique called pre-identification that basically it, it keeps a memory of, of the objects that you have seen and, and, you, and you, for some time, you, you try, you see if, if the object disappears, reappears again, then you do re-identification. Re That's one of the tasks actually in the NVIDIA challenge as well. And we do something else called CMC, that it's camera motion compensation, which would be kind of similar to the stabilization you have done in, the, in your work. Like, see if the, camera, if the camera is moving, right? then like just copying this bounding box in the next frame, that's a super bad idea, right? If you know, if you know and you can estimate that the camera has moved, just don't copy it in the exact location, but compensate it and move it to, to wherever it would be with the camera motion. So by doing that, uh, they, they obtain two more points of gain. Uh, if you like the technique, but you want it to be explained by one of the authors, I encourage you to watch this lecture by Laura Leal was here uh, last summer and she will be back also in this end of June. So if you want to see her, uh, you can attend to her lectures. Then as a finally, like there's something that kind of similar, but I'm not sure if, if the implementation is that good because it's not that popular, but in this world they did something similar like doing the regression with uh, an LSTM. But, okay. And I think that would be it about object tracking. Do you have any final question? Yep. Um, when you said about the new image identification, yeah, you ready? Is it used um, in this specific network? I don't know. How does it work? Because you have a detection of bounding box. Do you have some? What do you call it? Best for, what do you call it? Best uh, sift of best for that. Sorry. Uh, the, to identify that again, you need to take some features that describe. I mean, I, I must tell you that I can't, I mean, I don't really know the details, so okay. pro probably setting the question is very good, but okay. I, I cannot it's answer. Because I didn't understand how it works in this one. Yeah, probably click there and okay. probably maybe they explain it. No, it's, it's fine. It's a good question. Okay, but I cannot answer. I mean, I can think about ideas, but okay. probably it's not going to be the best one. Yeah, so let's have the 10 minutes break. So we start at 5.15, okay?